Hello, thank you all for joining us today for this virtual visit with Derek Adams. Derek is um, an artist we are just incredibly proud to have worked with at New York Health and Hospitals Harlem. Um, he did a fantastic project in the pediatric emergency department. And we'll also be doing the cover and stickers to our coloring book that's forthcoming, our no, volume eight. And today we're gonna have a look at a video that um, of Derek's tremendous show at uh, the new Salon 94 uptown. So hello and welcome, Derek. And we're gonna show the video and then if you'll um, talk to us about your about our project and about your show, I'd be so appreciative. So shall we begin? I think about art as being a very transformative experience. And I think that um, artists have the ability to um, transform the way people think about themselves and the way people think about culture. The work I made was not to create something that was joyous as much as create something that I feel is influential and important in a way that um, it already occupies the space. Because I honestly think that Black people um, don't really need to see images of trauma as much as they need to see images that are empowering and make them feel more humanized. And because the people I'm trying to connect with, I feel they need a break. You know, I make work for people who need a break. I feel like these are like exhibitions open for the street, open for the street audience on their way to work or walking through the neighborhoods. And I'm interested in the idea of products and costuming and things that deal with commercial consumption and thinking about the critical um, component of how consumerism shapes the way that people see themselves and the way people engage with each other and the way people are, are looked at. Probably like five or six years ago, I started photographing the mannequin storefronts without even thinking about a body of work. And then one day I just started looking through my phone and I started realizing, you know, I'm gonna paint these. You know, the image that's under the painting is a photographic image where the mannequin has one tone and I manipulated the tone of the mannequin to incorporate the various tones that are depicted in most of um, the contemporary mannequin heads and wig shops. And so I was really attracted to the root of the wig. And the root to me was really interesting as an image because it, also, it, it talks about uh, transition in a more graphic way. Well, my interest in geometric composition kind of started first with looking at a lot of West African sculpture and looking at the exaggerated form and the liberties that the creators took on, I guess, capturing certain um, important elements they felt were essential for the viewer to understand the importance of this figure and what this figure represents but the outcome is really still the same, is to be seen differently than you were seen the day before, or an hour before. But I think that's something that is uh, more of a, of a desire for people who um, can only control what they physically possess, which is their body. And I think that to me is a driving force for my creative practice. It was a perfect time to present this work. And until people start looking at the work that I make as normal or just, well, it's like it's a beautiful painting. Until people start really discussing the work in those terms, there's always going to be work to do. <laughs> All right, I'm, bringing, I'm trying to get your cameras back on. Hang on one second. Okay. There we go. Derek and Derek, <laughs> come on back. Okay. 
start my video. Hey, Derek. Um, hey. Huh. We, I'd love you to walk us through some of the works in your exhibition. And for those of you that haven't seen the exhibition at the new Salon 94 on, at 3 East 89, I really recommend you go because walking through with Derek is going to be awesome. But seeing the works in person is so incredibly powerful. So do Thank both. You. Listen on and, uh, and go see the work. Derek, do you want to walk Thank us you. through now? OK. Well, these particular this particular series entitled uh, Style Variations uh, really kind of came about, as was mentioned in the video, um, with a, a, you know, a few years of documenting storefront win wig, uh, windows at wig shops and neighborhoods, and, and, you know, in America, as well as places in, in the UK, um, somewhere in London, somewhere in Paris, these areas that mostly occupy by uh, black and brown um, people, and I just became really interested in just the the the, the visual language of it, and it kind of drew me to uh, begin making paintings um, of these actual wigs. So every painting that I've made is directly influenced by an actual wig from a wig shop, and um, in this exhibition, I decided to make these large uh, uh, paintings to kind of really uh, highlight and exaggerate some of the forms and some of the things happening uh, on the form, the mannequin form, which is which is the hair, the wig. And so I really think of these works as kind of like abstract paintings, kind of fused onto the the um, the heads of um, of these mannequin forms. And so I'm really thinking about hard edge abstraction um, as a um, language of making that kind of forms this thing of a familiar object with something that's more fluid and more expressive um, through paint and through painting. In exhibition, there are 10 large five by eight paintings um, that are um, a mixture of a photographic image taken and blown up, but also manipulated um, uh, and then painted on. So most of the actual object is as a painting with some elements that are still exposed from the photographic image. I think of these works, you know, in its uh, entirety as installation um, to appear to be more like these floating oracle uh, heads in space. And in the gallery, I, I, I feel that salon, the salon um, architecture in the gallery really uh, helps to highlight some of the um, kind of more um, mystical or um, or at least uh, atmospheric um, representation um, that the work um, represents um, with the space, with the white walls, with the rounded corners, um, and with the kind of really uh, frosty white uh, background um, around the figures, around the, the object. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Megan, can we um, next go to slides of Derek's project? Yeah, I'm ready. <clears throat> um, I tried to start the video. Oh, there we go. So Derek, as I mentioned before, did a tremendous project for us in the emergency department at Harlem Hospital. And he we were able to install it really just as the pandemic was calming down in New York in May. And it's just made such a tremendous difference, as staff tells me, for the patients and the staff. The staff's been taking selfies. One of my board members, Glory Cohn, and I visited, and it was just fantastic to see it in person. Um, you guys are going to have to be content with seeing it in slides. Hopefully, you won't have to visit the hospital. <laughs> Do you want to talk <laughs> about it, Derek? Um, when I was when I was uh, invited by Arx Art um, to consider an image for uh, a wallpaper in the in the emergency uh, department of Harlem Hospital, I was very very excited about the invitation. But I was also very nervous and also um, feeling very responsible um, as a as an artist to create an image that will resonate 
for the young patients who um, would frequent the hospital, you know? And one thing I was really concerned with is thinking about what will be uplifting for them in their experience of visiting the hospital. And when we went to the hospital to meet, to a site visit, um, when I met uh, Diane there, we also met some of the staff of the hospital. And I remember we met like the director of the, of the hospital, right? Was it the director we met, mm -hmm. Diane? Yes. Yes, we are frozen. Yeah, and you know, and one thing, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, it was, I think the image is frozen. And one thing that was really, oh yeah. Okay, and yeah. one thing that I remember um, hearing from the director is, is uh, she said, no one comes in here who's happy. You know, I remember that being the beginning conversation. And from that, I really thought about, you know, really taking myself out of the, out of the, um, out of the equation of, of, of um, being an, art, an artist making exactly what I wanted to make for the world, but also being very considerate of the audience and thinking about what, would I, what do I think they would want to see? as a child, a patient coming in to a hospital, a certain circumstances and being in this very kind of sterile room. Um, I thought about the series, The Floaters, which I have been working on for uh, some time. And I thought this would be a perfect um, image to create for as a backdrop to this uh, very um, intense experience of being in the hospital. It really, they're so joyful. <clears throat> you can see the staff loves it too. So coming from these images, we asked Derek if he would please um, do the cover of our next coloring book and also the sticker page. And I, <clears throat> and I think we have a picture of the sticker page, the sticker spread, yes. Those are gonna be amazing stickers. The kids are gonna love these. So I think now we can open it up to some questions if, if you'd like to um, speak. I was very that. excited to, to also do that. We're excited too, it's gonna to be amazing. So I think we're gonna open it up to questions now. If everybody wants to um, drop questions into the chat, we'll go through them and propose them to Derek. So one second and we will get started. Uh, we have several of the staff from um, Harlem Hospital joining us today, Derek, and Dr. Piran, who I believe that you met on one of your visits, asks, what message would you like to share with the pediatric patients in the emergency department who see your work in the treatment rooms? Uh, one thing that I would love to, to, to express is my gratitude um, for the positive response of the work and how I was very um, much focused on creating an image that would be uplifting and, and allow the, the, the patients and the people who work at the hospital to have just a visual uh, vacation um, looking at the work. So I'm hoping that, that this particular piece uh, did that. Completely. Um from Stephanie, she's asking when the coloring book comes out, Stephanie, we are working hard on that now and we expect it to be released this fall. Um, Derek from Greg, he asks, how do you see yourself inspiring young artists and what advice would you give them? Well, as an artist, you know, and, you know, making work for such a long time, I would just like to say to any artist, especially a younger artist to, just be very focused on your, you know, developing your craft as an artist and really be fo and focused on really thinking about what you want to say through, um, through your visual language. It's really important to kind of look around and be very observant of your, of your uh, surroundings and society and your friends and people like that and kind of figure out as an artist, where, you know, where can you fit in? What can you say? What can you offer to the conversation that you feel could be um, developed or even, um, or something you may seem, may have been overlooked. Think about, you know, what's important to you and what's important for you think people should know through your work, you know? And I think that's 
for me has always been a, an interest and a focus as I've as I've grown as an artist. Yeah, how um, we talked about this a little bit as people were coming in, but could you tell us a little bit about the residency and sort of exactly what you just said and how you'll instill that in the residents you invite to come? Well, I, well I'm in the midst of creating a residency in Baltimore called the Lash Retreat, um, the, um, the Lash Resort, sorry, Lash Resort Artist Retreat. And it's uh, in Midtown Baltimore. It's in a residential neighborhood. It's a pretty significant um, size lot where um, for participants in the areas of visual arts, lit literary, culinary, and tech, or other creative areas will be invited through um, an advisory um, um, uh, board. And it'll be a you know a yearly residency. Um, and the whole purpose of the residency is really more of a retreat in every form where the individuals are really invited to, um, to be there to kind of replenish, to reconnect, to, um, to relax. Um, studios will be on the premises if you would so choose to use them, but it's not a requirement. It's just something there for people um, who are creative, who may want to have an outlet while they're there for the, for the month uh, of the residency. Um, but it's really more about really bringing forth some of the ideas in my artwork to a real life experience for those who need it. And so for me, I just thought one day, maybe a couple of years ago, that I've been making this work, um, focusing on leisure and focusing on this idea of normalcy for um, um, for Black Black Americans and just Black people in general with everything that's happening in the world and has happened. And I decided, you know, why don't I just make this into a real place? Why do I just make this into a physical space that people can occupy that's not just about my art as a as an artist would work on the wall, but what about a place that they can actually come and talk about these things that I feel are so important for the growth of humanity and for just um, the growth of um, Black society, and you know, because there's so many things happening, and you know, there's all there's, there's so many levels of um, of um, misunderstanding and what is needed in order to survive. And I personally think that, you know, with everything happening um, in society, that um, there should be a place of refuge and sanctuary and, and creative people should be able to come and not have conversations about things that are more triggering than relaxing. And so for me, if I can do that for um, creative people for a few weeks or, you know, I mean, why not? And I think that it would also help the creative people there to grow and to understand their role in society in a way that may not necessarily be um, promoted, you know? So I'm looking forward to the development of it. It's definitely gonna take a while, but I'm hoping that it will officially open uh, the spring of next year. It sounds like an incredible destination for respite that you're creating for this community. Um, can you tell us a little bit about artists or creatives or any figures who have been influences for you? Um, yeah, a lot of my peers, I feel, are very much part of my just um, sustainability creatively. You know, I have peers, some of my closer close peers who I've kind of started making work with in, at my very young age, like Micheline Thomas is a great close friend, one of my closest friends, and Kehinde Wiley, um, that's kind of some of my peers that I kind of came, um, you know, came up with um, as artists uh, who are also very much committed to community and doing things for uh, other artists, as well as, you know, really focus, a very focused practice. Um, to name just a couple, I have a lot, so many different influences, but those are the two artists that I'm in conversation with uh, mostly um, and artists that I've, you know, I've known since um, Micheline, I, we met in undergrad at Pratt. Um, Hinde, I met through Micheline in his first year at grad school at Yale. So since that, that time, we've kind of been very close. And I'm influenced by just not only the work of other artists, but also the way that they, um, the way that they are committed to their practice. That's always a very, um, for me, very alluring uh, attribute for artists is not just their ability to make work, but how they do it, how they, what's, what's their system 
of um, our production and process. That to me has always been such a very important part of art making um, as an educator. I teach at Brooklyn College. I, I'm a co-director of the, of the art department there. So I work with a lot of younger artists all the time and I really enjoy it. Yeah, that was gonna be my next question for you is um, what you are teaching right now. Yeah, I teach um, senior thesis for the, um, for the uh, undergrad BFA students and also teach the MFA seminar. Um, and this is my third year there and uh, I'm a tenure track professor there. So, I mean, I enjoy it. I mean, I think it keeps me grounded. Um, it's not always the most um, um, opportune, like not opportune, but it's not always convenient for me with everything else happening with, um, with my schedule, exhibition schedule. But I feel like it kind of keeps me like so accountable in a different way than um, my art practice. How has that experience been for you in light of the pandemic? How has that changed things, doing things virtually with your students and whatnot? Well, it's been really complicated, I guess, you know, like most artists will probably teach right now, just being in these virtual um, classes with making your work and also doing virtual meetings with galleries and stuff has also, you know, it's been like a lot of, you know, just a lot of hats at this particular time. Um, and it's very different when you're teaching in person versus virtual virtual because in person you're looking at art and you're walking around while you're talking to students but when you're teaching virtually you have a very um direct um, um you know i i um contact with students as well more so than you would if you were in that studio because using a studio you may not even look at the person as much you're looking at the art and that's what it's really about but with the virtual studio visits, which I do, um, it's either a presentation of images um, while we talk, but it's really a very frontal experience of uh, speaking, which is, you know, could be very draining. But um, but I hope, you know, this will be, um, you know, we'll be moving back onto campus because we've been off campus. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good to hear. Going back to your process and the style variation show, David asks, um, he first of all says, your work is beautiful. And he's wondering in these paintings, what role does the wig play or symbolize in the interaction with the mannequin? Well, the thing that I really was, was attracted to with the work and starting this, the style variations is first my desire to make art as an artist and looking for content is something that is so much part of um, my daily interests, you know, life interests, you know, not even looking for content, but realizing what's around me that is about content and that content is, um, is somehow um, at my fingertips. And the, the work came about because I really wanted to paint as I, you know, with the work, but I also want to paint with meaning. And so, um, I was really interested in this idea of abstraction. And I'm always interested in the idea of abstraction versus uh, figuration. And I'm also interested in how these two things could merge together to accomp uh, accomplish both, um, both things. And to me, the wigs um, really are um, these very abstract, abstract liquid um, um, formations. And I think they, that merging them onto the mannequin head kind of creates this other activated um, visual experience that, um, that for me um, is like a translation of what I felt looking at the mannequin, the real mannequin heads in the window. I felt like the work that I made is depicting the influence that those things had on me as a viewer and my translation of those things to the, to the viewer through, um, through painting. Got it. Um, LaVon is wondering if you will be doing any prints from this series. Um, I'm not sure. I've been considering it. Um, I was, I've been considering the idea of it as a print edition. Uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I think there would be a lot of us who would be excited. <laughs> Please do. Yeah. <laughs> um, another question or sort of 
Um, your work ranges from video and sound pieces to graphic and sculptural works. Can you tell us about the challenges or benefits of working between so many different mediums? Um, for me, I've always been really interested in this kind of multidisciplinary practice. And it kind of came about because I started realizing as an artist who was interested in that practice of how crucial it was that certain things are presented in the form in which would be the best, um, the best representation of the idea. And, you know, it kind of started by the way I make work. I'll start off with something that may be very flat, but then I will realize that this is not really the best representation of this idea. So I kind of shifted to something that's more dimensional because maybe that particular piece or, or that particular conversation is best met with something that you can walk around that you can experience. So it was really more about the multi the multidisciplinary practice kind of came about more so because I'm less interested in the, the idea of perfection in the, the practice of art making. And I'm more interested in the way, in the idea of deliverance and being, you know, and being able to deliver the, 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 the work or the message through the work in a way that um, is clear and also um, the most successful. So the disciplinary practice for me is really more about the best, the, the, the most effective way to communicate um, through the, the material. And sometimes it may be a video, sometimes it may be a performance, you know, it's less about me and it's more about what is the best uh, approach. Yeah, definitely. I, I think for a lot of us, um, Freeze Los Angeles was the last fair d that Diane and I were at and Salon 94's booth with your work that preceded the Hudson River Museum show of We Came to Plan and Party was just incredible. Thank you. Thank you. I was really excited to see that install because, you know, a lot of that work was made, some you know, made in different places. The, the wallpaper was made in the computer. The the collages were made, you know, in the physical space, but, you know, seeing them all together as a piece was, you know, was exciting for me as well, because it was the first time that I, was, I actually was able to um, really integrate um, the wallpaper. Well, I did it before in my show at Luxembourg and Diane um, that year, but I felt like this particular piece, the party and plan, where it was all, almost like the works on the wall were kind of camouflaged, um, with with um, with the figures, uh, with the wallpaper, they had had a very similar motif, you know, and so I felt like it had a certain level of success, more so than the sh the previous um, the first time I did it. Yeah, I mean, I I think both of them accomplished that on such different levels, but such fun levels. I mean, I just remember the Luxembourg Diane show. It, it was like some of the kitchen elements were just like caught you by surprise. Like <laughs> yeah. you look twice and see something new. It was so much fun. And I'm sure the kids at um, Harlem Hospital feel that way too when they look a different angle and see something else. So going back before Pratt, you know, even as a kid, what, what was the catalyst for inspiring you to become an artist? What sort of made that shift to say, this is what you wanted to do for your life? I actually had a, a really amazing art teacher uh, when I was in elementary school and grade school. Her name was Ms. Wilson. And she was also, I, I remember her as being a very young uh, woman as well. She seemed like she may have been new to teaching. Um, uh, Black American, um, I guess my neighborhood is primarily, um, you know, uh, middle-class um, Black uh, Americans in Baltimore. And the school I went to was a very, it was a great school. It was called Edgecombe Elementary School. And it even had a cool name, you know? And um, Ms. Wilson would always, um, she saw that I was interested in art. And I was really, um, you know, like um, a student who loved to, you know, loved to draw. And so she realized that I was interested in art. And then she just basically started giving me like assignments that were, um, in addition to what we were doing in class, just for me to have things to challenge me outside of class. And she started giving me, you know, um, assignments that were linked to like citywide contests and things like that. It was about energy conservation or heritage based um, contests. And I won a couple. Um, and, um, and then I, you know, I started to really understand art and what it could do. And I got to meet the mayor of one contest. I, I 
was my work was hung in the mayor's office and I got to meet the mayor. And um, I just started thinking about art in a way that I wasn't necessarily thinking about it before as a kid. But since kindergarten, I would always say that I wanted to be an artist, even if I didn't know necessarily what that really entailed. I felt like having Ms. Wilson as my kind of introduction into like really having focused, uh, a focused art practice, I think helped me to understand uh, my role as an artist uh, more so than um, just making work. Yeah, I, I remember reading um, one of the articles too about you choosing Pratt and coming to New York and sort of just getting off and walking around Fort Greene and saying, this is it, this is where I need to be. Can you tell us a little bit about that and why, why, why Pratt, why Brooklyn? Well, when I was in Baltimore, where I grew up, I was, um, had to do a book report. I was going to like uh, a college before I transferred to um, Pratt and I had to do a book report on an artist and I went to the public library in Baltimore, in a Pratt library and I um, happened to come across a book on this amazing artist. His name was Jacob Lawrence. And when I looked, I looked at the work before I saw him. And when I eventually turned to the back of the book, it was a photograph of a young, you know, black man with a pipe. And I guess it was an old book from, you know, his beginning career. And, and I really enjoyed the work before I even knew who he was. And then when I realized and I read in the book that he taught at Pratt, and I guess that when that book was published, he probably was at Pratt or teaching at Pratt. And <clears throat> when I realized, you know, this is when I heard of Pratt, I've never heard of Pratt until then. And then I was so blown away by the work. It, I said to my teacher, I'm moving to New York. I'm going to Pratt. <laughs> and, uh, and basically I just, you know, contacted Pratt, created a portfolio, went there, uh, got in and moved to New York. And of course he was no longer working there, Jacob, but I had a lot of conversations with people who he taught, who were now teachers at Pratt. And I had the, the privilege of actually meeting him um, during my time at Pratt when they honored him um, through the alumni depart um, department. They asked me to ask, actually, uh, they asked me to escort he and his wife, Gwendolyn for the day. And so I kind of hung out with Jacob Lawrence all day Wow. And um, I was just so blown away. I wasn't even talking. I was just looking at him and looking <laughs> at her as they were talking to each other about whatever their daily conversations. I was just hanging a fly on the wall, but I learned so much just kind of hanging out with Jacob Lawrence for the day. And I felt like, wow, this is like so mind blowing. I came to New York just for this, because this guy taught here. And now I'm like escorting him around campus, you know, and that was pretty awesome. That's incredible. Do you remember, did he say anything that just stayed with you or any advice that he gave you that day? Um, not, I mean, everything he said was just like, you know, how you, when you're around someone who you can believe you're around, you just, everything is like, you don't even remember anything <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because they're like talking and you're just smiling the whole time. You're saying to yourself, oh my God, like I'm hanging out with Jacob <laughs> Lawrence. And um, I just remember um, by the end of the day, we, end of the evening, we were really, you know, connecting and talking and he um and they were there was a poster that they had made for the celebration he had you know he signed it to me um and it was really you know just great it was just more like it was more of a confirmation of meeting him more than any word spoken it was almost like it was almost saying that you were meant to be here right. with all the things that has happened to me coming up to going to Pratt <clears throat> and then this person who I think with the, the main influence of me coming there, having to meet him and his, you know, cause he was a, you know, up in age at that point and he was there um, just to be honored at Pratt. So it was really, um, a, it was just a, a mind blowing uh, experience but it really made me feel like I was on the right track. Right, what an honor and a privilege. That's so cool. I was so happy. It was, <laughs> I, can't, I still feel happy when I think about it to the day, you know? Yeah. Well, honestly, Derek, I mean, I'm sure you are becoming that figure for a lot of your students. And that's another question we we ask the artists that we work with on these, you know, you, you're either inspiring your students or the patients at Harlem Hospital. Um, as a career artist now, what experience have you had that have taught you what to do or what not to do in order to be successful? Well, for me, a lot of things that I do just, I've always pretty much focused on um, 
is doing things that make you that you feel good about. You know, if you go into a lot of things without the idea of commerce as being the main fo um, focus, then I think you have a better experience uh, with things as an artist. I, I, I feel like as an artist, um, the monetary part of being an artist is something that is kind of like the, the thing to not aspire to as much as the thing, uh, and, and, unless it has to do with being able to keep making art for me. Like, you know, when you think about, like for me, the idea of success as an artist is being able to buy more paper and buy more paint and those things, or, you know, those things that are just very uh, necessary in order to continue to make work. So for me, making money or from selling art really just talks about how I'm able to buy more supplies to make art. And so that to me, that's the, the most important thing to think about when you think about your art as the idea of, um, as a financial structure for yourself as an artist. But I just think that art in general, I teach because I like the freedom of making what I want to make. And that's one of the things that I've always learned from um, my experience as an artist is having uh, a job. See, art to me, if art was a job, I wouldn't, like it, I wouldn't like it as much. And teaching to me is a job that requires not making art, but talking about art. And talking about art to me is more like a job when it comes to talking to your other artists, I feel like an advisor, I feel like a mentor. That's to me, I feel like that's work. But to me, art is so much fun. Making art is so, it's, not, it's a joy. And to think of it as a job, I would not as be as excited about it, but teaching to me gives me this, this level of accountability that I think art releases me from in a way, because for me, art starts as being a very therapeutic process without rhyme or reason. And then it comes into thing, and then it develops into what people see based on research and conversations about, casual conversations about ideas from other friends and people like that, or, or educators that I'm also and I'm close with. And then it comes into this object that you see in the gallery or in my studio or somewhere like that. But teaching to me, the conversation we have, I have with my students are things that are, you know, it's work, you know, the idea of like, you know, answering questions about the future of someone else's creative creative direction. You had to think about these things in a way that is not really about me personally, it's about someone else. And so I feel a le different level of responsibility for teaching that I associate with a job more than my artwork, art making. Yeah. If that makes any sense. I don't know. No, to me, it does. I don't know. Some people might yeah, not. Yeah, completely. And, you know, your work just exudes so much joy, Derek. And that's clearly something that everybody really needs right now. But with that in mind, and if, if money were no problem, what would a dream project be for you? Uh, honestly, the project I'm doing in Baltimore is like a dream project. Growing up in Baltimore, um, you know, growing up in inner city, um, you know, being around creative people most of my life, I would never think that I would have the opportunity to create a space that really fosters this continued um, community of creative people to come together, to have a space, um, to hang out, to talk about things that are important to each other and for me, I feel like that's like one of the most, I think that today, I think the, the residency or the idea of it um, is the most, um, for me is the most uh, exciting. Like I'm excited like all day, you know, I have like a, I have like a video camera on the, on the property and I like look at it all day as they're working on, <laughs> on the property. I'm at dinner, I'm like looking at the surveillance camera outside, looking at things being built and, um, and it's just so exciting to see um, the development take place. Um, right. I can't be there in person, cause, you know, so I, I try to keep tabs on what's going on. And that, to me, I, that just makes me really, you know, really happy. Yeah, it's like people with their pet cam keeping an eye on their babies, but this is your <laughs> Yeah, baby. that's how I feel. Sometimes people are saying to me, what are you looking at? You still looking at your, uh, <laughs> the thing? I'm like, no, I'm just looking at, you know, 
I'm looking at things being, you know, things are happening. You know, I, I look later on that night and I might see something there that wasn't there, you know. So things like those things are exciting me right now because I never thought it would be an, I would have an opportunity to cultivate and support the community um, that I grew up in in a way that I'm able to do right now. And so I'm, I, to me, that keep, that's keeping a lot of my attention. Yeah, that was that was going to be my last question was from Greg in our audience. He was asking, what impact do you think your artwork and has in the art world and in the community? But I really think you've answered that for us and what you're doing with this residency and the last resort is really building a legacy for what you want. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it, you know, and I and I, you know, and I enjoy making my work and I enjoy where my work is taking me as a, as, a, as an artist. And I hope to continue to, uh, to, you know, to, to create images that I feel resonate with people in a way that make them feel um, empowered or at least uh, give them a sense of normalcy or even joy. Um, because I think that, again, that's something that I feel can still be as um, radical um, and necessary um, in days and in, in situations that we exist in. Uh, and have existed in. So um, that's always going to be um, a, mo a motivation for me uh, in the studio. And so that to me, I feel like I, that's carved out. Um, what's new to me is dealing with like, um, like architecture and, and renovations. That's totally like a lot to deal with, <laughs> right. you know, contractors. That's like a lot, you know. Well, you've got you've got a good team for that in the works. So you stay focused you. on the vision. Thank you. Diane, do you have any more questions? I just want to say thank you so much, Derek. It's really always exciting to speak with you and listen to you talk about your work. Um, thank you so much for today. Thanks so much for working with RxArt. We're so honored to be working with you. And thank you, Megan. Oh, thank you, Derek. Thank yeah, you. Thank you to our guests for the awesome questions. And if you can't see the Salon 94 show, um, Emily had put the checklist through the chat and we'll send a follow-up email to everybody. But thank you so much for your time, Derek. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I enjoy it and uh, good luck with RX Art. You guys are doing great work and I'm so happy to be a part of it. Thank you. And thank you to, and thank you to Salon 94 and, and the staff there for, the, for you know putting together such a, a great install and just helping me with, you know, all the things that are necessary to keep the shit moving. <laughs> Completely. Thank you, Kat. And thank, thank you. you to everybody at Salon 94. Derek, this has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Ciao, ciao. ciao.